Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to our last webinar of 2017, the now annual December session on planning for export success next year. My name is William Barnes-Graham, and I am the Digital Content Manager at Open to Export. We are an online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, export action plan tool, and our quarterly competitions. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for the, international, for the sector of international trade, who offer a unique range of individual and businesses, business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, and you can ask questions at any point during the webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen. We have three fantastic speakers today. We'll have our very own Leslie Batcher giving tips about areas like market selection, gaining export skills, and using our export action plan tool to create an export strategy. We'll have Rick Gardner from First Job Ales, one of this year's winners of the Export Action Plan competition, and he'll be sharing tips on what's been a, a very interesting year in export for him, for sure. And kicking things off, we have Craig Durnell from Bibby Financial Services, who have kindly sponsored our recent Export Action Plan competition and today's webinar. And Craig will be talking through some of the fantastic research and support Bibby provide for SMEs looking to enter international trade. So to get things started, over to you, Craig. Thank you, Will, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So what I just wanted to run through today is some of the key findings we've um, undertaken in our, in our research, some of the top tips we give to exporters and some of the challenges they face in, and hopefully give them some ideas of how they can overcome those challenges. So if I looked at the first slide, just a, an introduction to myself. So I'm the managing director of the export business of Bibby Financial Services. Um, I've been there for, for just over four years after spending 20 odd years with HSBC uh, and latterly with Royal Bank of Scotland. So what, what do we actually do in Bibby Financial Services? We, we actually fund invoices. So we are invoice financiers. So if you haven't come across that before, just very briefly how it works is when you have a, a, an invoice that you send to your customers, you would send an invoice financier a copy of that. And then generally what would happen is within 24 hours, a certain percentage of that invoice ranging from 80 to say 90% of that invoice is given to you straight away. Um, and then the remainder of the invoice on collection is collected back to you. And the key thing really is that you don't have to wait, say, 30, 60, 90 days until that invoice is paid. You can get a large chunk of it up front, which really does help cash flow. Um, so that's what we do. A little bit around Bibi, a bit around Bibi Financial Services in terms of our credentials, but Bibi Financial Services, the UK's leading independent invoice finance provider. We've got nearly 10,000 customers now in, in more than 300 sectors across the world. So we deal with every sector you can possibly think of. We've got 1,200 employees and we're, we're in the top 100 times best companies to work for. We've got operations in 40 countries, uh, sorry, 40 offices and 13 countries around the world, um, which is really, really important to us. You can see some of the countries we're in. Um, and those are some of the key export destinations. So it's really important for us that we're actually on the ground in those countries. And then finally, we are a family run business. We have been for over 200 years now in, in Sir Michael Bibby and the family are still very close to, to running the business on a day to day basis. So that's just a little bit about us and actually what, what we do. So the key thing I wanted to go into now on the, the, the next slide is some of the, the research that we've, we've undertaken. So throughout July, August and September, we, we surveyed over 500 established importers and exporters just to understand their views on, on things such as Brexit, 
the currency volatility and how that's impacted them in, in some of the complexities that they face on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and the research I'll share with you now is, is going to go into that in a little more, more detail. I suppose overriding what, what's interesting to me, what's happening at the moment, is that the government have recently abandoned its long-standing target of doubling UK exports to one trillion by 2020. And I think while a lot of onlookers pointed to, you know, Brexit as being the reason why that happened, the government have, have said it was down to a, a slowdown in global growth. So I think one thing's for sure with Brexit, what we've seen with our clients is that it's thrown up not only threats, uh, and we can't deny the threats, but also lots and lots of opportunities. So we and Bibi feel international trade is, is still really good, it's still really profitable for, for businesses. And what we're looking to do is try and get more and more people thinking about exporting or just expanding into to more and more countries. Um, it's estimated at the moment that fewer than one in five either import or, or export, I think it's probably closer to one in 10 of UK businesses that, that export. And this is in, in spite of a lot of people in, in Open to Export will of course be one of those talking about the real benefits of doing it. So I don't think there's a simple answer to the question in terms of why people aren't doing it. But as I said, the real thing for us is how we get more and more businesses doing it. Some of the, some of the, the slide here, just to run through, is the top export destinations. The, the US is the largest economy in the world in, and is clearly a big attraction for UK exporters who are particularly looking to, to leverage the made in Britain quality mark you know, we've got. So you know, the, the US in particular really do like that made in Britain quality. Um, and whilst the US represents the, the most important export destination, it is followed really closely by Germany, France and Ireland, all within the, the EU trading bloc. In fact, the findings show that 50% of the top 20% export, sorry, top 20 export destinations are in the EU. Some of the emerging markets coming out from the research was China and India, uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, are quite quite key at the moment with Malaysia, Brazil, and Nigeria, South Africa, and Mexico all appearing very heavily in terms of where people are exporting at the moment. Some of the top challenges are, are, I'll speak about in more detail later on. The, the impact on Brexit you can see there, I think everybody knows the uncertainty that we're, we're going through. Um, they're, they're, it's interesting to note 11% see it as being really good for their business at the moment, but, but more, more so 37% are saying that it's, it's having a negative impact on, on their business. So getting real clarity over the UK's trading relationship with the EU for everyone is, is clearly vital. You can see as well just on the, the left hand side of the slide, which I, I think is really interesting, we've seen bad debts on the rise. So more and more of the SMEs we've spoken to and researched have actually said that they had to write off a bad debt uh, this year. So making sure you know people are really planning for bad debts and accounting for it, and making sure they do all the, the basic things around chasing their debt quickly, making sure they get their invoices raised quickly is, is really, really important. The other thing there, just in terms of um, foreign exchange rates, 67% of the businesses we researched said that has had a, a negative impact on, on their business. So this is generally when they um, uh, arrange a deal, they will price for it accordingly on a, on a certain exchange rate. But if that exchange rate moves when they actually get paid, then it can have a negative impact on, on the business. And actually making sure their skilled staff available is again, is a, is a big, big challenge. So just looking at the, the next slide, um, just going on, the, the top SMEs um, export destinations, you can see the top ones in there, just so you, if you're looking to do it or you're actually in those markets at the moment, you, you can see the top ones to look at. But the, 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 the sort of graph underneath is we've gone to businesses in, in those countries and asked them what are their views on the domestic economy. Um, and as you can see, with the exception of Hong Kong and the UK, all of those other 
countries believe their economy is going to get better in the next 12 months. So again, might give you a view if you're looking to export into some of those countries, they feel quite optimistic if you look at the Netherlands or or Germany or US or Ireland in France, they're feeling quite optimistic over the next 12 months about their own domestic uh, economy. If we also then just um, look at, I suppose, the seasonality, um, although there's no real compelling trend uh, amongst exporters, I think the sales are at the lowest in the first quarter of the year um, and the busiest are, are in quarter three. So if you're looking to plan for your business in, in, in setting up or you're looking to really grow or, or looking to increase stock, that might give you a feel of where best to, to, to ramp up your activity. Just now going on to some of the, the key findings in, in the research, I think the complexities of selling overseas, you know, they can't be underestimated in addition to the normal challenges of, of operating a business. But overwhelmingly, the, the biggest challenge faced in SMEs from our research was the volatility in currency exchange rates. Um, and our research revealed that Businesses trading overseas have been disadvantaged to the tune of £69,000 in the past year due to the currency fluctuations. And we really do believe more can be done to protect businesses against the risks of currency volatility around education, in, in managing foreign exchange rate risk, in, and encouraging businesses to, to review their existing FX uh, arrangements. Because, you know, as I said, if you set up a, a deal on a certain rate, and then by the time it gets paid, that rate is changed, then it really can hurt you is, is a business. I think the second one, if we look at logistics, road, rail, sea, air, they all provide complexities for exporters, irrespective of whether you choose to handle that yourself or you outsource the management of it. But I would, I would just say on the logistics, if you're gonna do it yourself, make sure you know you're really prepared because the goods need to get there when you say they're going to get there and if you're going to outsource it just make sure you you get someone who's really recommended to, to do that the, the final i suppose top top third one was accurate paperwork and i i think this is vital to to trade in overseas you know export licenses customs declarations vat proof of export are just a few examples of the type of paperwork required to decrease your risk and comply with legislation and avoid delays in shipping in, in delivery. So for me, really, really important you get people around you or, or yourself to have the capability to, to manage that paperwork correctly. The other things that come out when we speak to our clients around language barriers, time zones, payment delays and chasing debt. You know, all really important when you set up a, a contract and you're doing work, you know, you want to make sure you get paid. And sometimes that's more difficult if you can't speak the language to get paid. Or, quite frankly, they may well be in bed when you're trying to ring them to, to, to collect the payment. So really, really important you have processes in place to, to overcome those. Um, the next slide, please. So just a few of, of our sort of top tips that we speak to um, exporters about and what they speak to us about. But there's, there's, there's lots and lots of tips, but the, these are ours that we, we generally run through. So the first one is, is where to go. So in the EU, Germany is sort of over, overwhelmingly viewed as the most important country to the UK's economy. So it's followed by, by France. In, in small businesses, particularly who have little experience exporting outside the EU, are drawn to nearby countries with similar trading environments. And I think while such markets may be a good place to start due to the sort of proximity and ease of doing businesses, don't be limited by that. Let the market opportunity help decide where you choose to, to export. The second one is research, and I can't emphasize enough, research the market. So research the best markets for your products or services really establish what your competitive edge is, is gonna be, your unique selling point. Um, find out about your competition. You know, what are they charging? What are their market share? And as I mentioned before, you know, you really should consider language barriers, time zones, 
legal and the cultural nuances of some of the markets that you're looking to, to enter into because that can have a massive impact on your your sales, your operations, and I suppose critically your your bottom line. The third one, don't don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, having a good spread of customers in different countries can really help protect against an over-reliance on, on a small number of markets. It can also help to minimize the impact on any economical or, or sorry, economic or political changes of your client's, custom, uh, client's base. Um, so it can really help protect against that. And, and emerging markets such as China and India have long been touted as markets that present great opportunities for the UK SMEs, where the Made in Britain brand goes a long way. You know, in, and I spoke about the US in, in the Far East really do like that, that Made in Britain tag. Um, I've spoken about the awareness of, of currency exchange risks already. And then just finally, you know, for, for any business, but I think particularly for exporters, um, which brings challenges about extended customer payment, make sure you've got a cash flow plan. You know, make sure you're tracking where your cash is, when it's likely to come in, and when, when particular areas of the month it may be difficult, um, that you really do speak to people who can help you at, at that time. But having a plan and having a cash flow forecast is actually vital for, for, for our exporters. The next slide, please. So just a few other things I think just to, just to be aware of when you're dealing with a financier. Um, now, of course, you would probably expect me to say, Bibi, do all of these things. But, you know, there are, there are financiers out there who, who really want to help exporters as we do. But these are a few things for me just to, to look out for and uh, work with a, a financier who can provide you with these things. So the first one, maximize the level of funding available. And what, I'm, what I mean by that, as I spoke about, at the very start, an invoice financier would generally give you, you know, anywhere between 80 to 90 percent of your sales ledger. Some do far less than that. So really work with someone where you're going to get the maximum from your sales ledger. Work with someone who's going to give you 100 percent support towards your export debt. Some financiers feel it's a bit more risky and won't fund all export debt. So they may well cap it. Single debtor relationships, and although I just said recently, you know, it's, it's not good to have all your eggs in one basket, we do appreciate sometimes when you're starting off, that, that, that's what happens. You've only got one or two debtors. So working with a, a financier who can still support you, even when you've got one or two, again, is really important. Having export relationship manager experts, and what, what I mean by that is, some financiers will, will have relationship managers who've got portfolios with all types of um, UK businesses in it and, a, and a sprinkling of exporters. But working with one where they deal predominantly with exporters, I think is really useful. They understand the complexities. They speak the same language as you and understand the challenges. So that is vital. Funding invoices around the, the globe. Again, work with someone who can fund the countries you're in and want to go in. There are some countries that people won't fund, you know, due to political or, or war and torn countries. But, but make sure you're speaking to financiers about what countries they can fund for you. Provide access to worldwide network. Again, you know, like us, we're in a number of countries. But work with a financier who can, who can give you their contacts overseas. They can give you a better view on their, their sort of customs in those countries and also give you access to their networks in those countries. Foreign language collections, I think this again is really, really important. You know, sometimes when you set up, you know, a deal, you will speak in English. Sometimes when you're looking to get your money back or there's disputes, then they might not always speak English. Or actually in their credit control team, you know, overseas, they might not have people who speak English. So, Again, work with someone who's got global collections capabilities, who can speak the languages that, you know, you need them to speak. And then, as I said, I spoke about before, you know, foreign exchange experts, make sure you've got someone who can give you that foreign exchange expertise. 
And I just wanted to finish with um, a, a case study, if I, I may, which is the, the final slide from me, which is um, a business just to, I suppose, bring it to life, really, that, that we've worked with. Uh, Silent is uh, a really good business that design and manufacture uh, surveillance and security uh, equipment. Uh, generally, the, you'll see it on boats in the middle of the ocean so they can see when, uh, when things are coming. Um, when we started to work with them, they had offices in the UK, but they, they've grown. Uh, and that's really great for us to see a, a, an exporter grow is, is a really good story. And we, we help them grow by giving them more money than their existing provider. We actually maximize their, their sales ledger. We help them with their collections overseas by speaking the languages in the countries that they're in. And they also fix their exchange rates with us. So they fix in so they know exactly what rate they're going to get at the end of their transaction when, when eventually they, they get paid. And um, I suppose, you know, what I would say is that we deal with businesses that have got sales ledgers at 50,000 when people just start up to businesses that turn over 20 odd million. And, and the key aim for me and my team is that we want to help exporters and we want to give them, you know, access to, to funds to allow them to do that. Said so we've got all of our research that we're more than happy to share with you in, in all of our guides. So if you need any of that, then please obviously let us know. And um, we're gonna answer, ask, um, answer questions right at the very end. But um, if I can just finish off with, um, you know, I do wish you all the very best. If you're looking to do it for the first time, then it is far more rewarding than the, the challenges that, that present itself. And if you're an established exporter, then again, I wish you well for the, the year ahead. Thank you. Um, I now, actually, I've got great delight in handing over to, to Leslie Batchelor uh, OBE, who will give you some more information on, uh, on Open to Export. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Greg. That was really brilliant. So useful and very well put as well. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, it's always difficult to follow after somebody who's been as articulate as that. So I'm going to have a, a very good try. Can I go on to the next slide, please, Louie? Okay, so the Open to Export project uh, has always been about setting up a plan and getting people to, to understand the, the various elements of international trade. And what we did was we took um, uh, the five elements that we could see and we made them into stages. And the first one is, of course, getting started. Um, and at that point, we try and get people to think a little bit about how they're going to, whether they're ready for international trade and how they might set about getting themselves ready. Uh, the second stage is about selecting a market and at that point we want to try and get people to really prioritize their efforts and their energies into a specific market rather than just responding. So obviously there's nothing wrong with just responding because that's how business works but actually having a plan as to how you're going to go forward and how you're going to make that really happen uh, is really what differentiates uh, a, a reactive exporter to someone who's going to have a sustained export activity over a great many years. Finally, the third bit part of the stage is going reaching customers, and reaching customers is you know uh, about marketing. It's about how you how you're going to find partners in that market and how you're going to do that. It's a it's a great area of uh, skill trying to find the right partners and trying to understand how you can work. They've got to reflect the way you operate, and it's uh, we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, Fourth area is about pricing and getting paid. And this is very much along the same lines as uh, Craig was talking about. One of the things that we always find is everything in international trade appears to take three times longer than you thought it was going to take. And then finally, we've got the de delivery and documentation, uh, making sure you get the goods uh, to the destination on time so that you please the customer and you can actually retain that customer. So perhaps we can start going into a little bit more detail now. Thanks, Luby. Okay, so what we've done is we de developed an export action plan tool. So the whole website itself, it covers those five topics. And as you click into each one of those topics, you will have found that there was an, an A4 page just explaining the basics and then giving you more links and more detail if you wanted that. The point of the export action plan is so that you can actually pull all those, ex all those steps together and actually 
give you an idea as to how you're going to uh, move forward and take own take the onus uh, away from um, external forces and build it straight into your board decision making into how you're going to actually drive this forward as an export project. So what we do is we have uh, tasks that you can complete and exercises that actually relate to those five steps we just talked about. So each question is accompanied by a series of prompts, video guides and useful resources. And at the end of each section, you get a chance to set actions for yourself, which actually will help you to understand uh, chronologically what you need to do, um, because sometimes there's a little bit of research and sometimes it's a little bit of, of uh, work on, on technical issues that you need to look into. So at the end of those sections, you get to set those actions. And then once you've completed the actions, then you actually are asked if you want to generate uh, an, a PDF report which becomes your action plan that you can work with and you can either keep it for yourself or and use it with your board or you can actually take it along to uh, UK Export Finance, to Bibi, to Department for International Trade, to the Chambers of Commerce. You know there's lots of people out there willing to help you to understand how to move forward. So this is just a, a, a slide, uh, the next series of slides are going to show you the actual action plan that you will see so um, you can't see it uh, at the moment, and you can't hear it at the moment, but the, the picture of the gentleman with an arrow on his head actually is a chap who's going to talk you through the basics of everything you need to know for that section. So, you know, this section is all about products and what we need to do is get you to think about uh, how you prioritise your offerings, how, you know, what are you going to sell abroad? British companies have a tremendous tendency to actually try and uh, sell all their offerings and actually sometimes it's best to take a step back and think about selling the ones you know you can sell really well and that don't need too much support in, in a new market. So we work through uh, the Boston Consulting Group, you'll see at the bottom there, there's a couple of useful resources about assessing demand for your product or services. And I think there's another part to this slide. Lugin? There we go. Uh, and that helps you to actually pre present this action plan tool, uh, gives you this report. Uh, in this case, this is one obviously uh, that we made up for you, which is all about little bears and stuffed toys. But the actual action plan is generated, it's downloaded to your computer, but best of all, it's held there so that actually you can you can do 10 minutes work on your action plan one evening and a quarter of an hour's action um, the next day, three hours the next. It's entirely up to you how you do this. Um, what you also need to remember is that there's always somebody out there to help you and we have put in the uh, government office uh, trade contacts. Obviously there are other people uh, available but you know it's useful just to start with the government officials. Um, perhaps we can move on to the next slide. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the, the section called getting started. And one of the things that uh, we recommend when starting any business plan is obviously to conduct a SWOT analysis. So once you've done this, you can consider the weaknesses and threats that you need to address. Most importantly, especially with an international uh, event. So what you're really doing is having a look at your business from a, a different angle, a slightly different, wider angle. Are you ready for export really? So things like do you have the capital or the way of covering the capital gaps as Bibi mentioned, Craig mentioned earlier, very important just to make sure you're understanding what you're about to commit yourself to because what we want it to be is a huge success. We do not want it to be something where you learn from mistakes and you felt that you weren't enjoying it at all. So do you have the routes to market, online distribution, how are you working at the moment so you can compare it to how you might work in another market? Will you need to translate or adjust your offering? We know that actually uh, a website, if it's translated into the local language, is much more likely to succeed. Indeed, if anybody around the world is looking for a product, they are four times more likely to buy it if it's actually presented to them in their own language. So this translation thing or the interpreting is a very important issue. Uh, do you have the internal skills and knowledge in terms of paperwork and shipping? And I think we know that a lot of people don't. Uh, do you have a relationship with a freight forwarder? Uh, next slide. 
once we've done that, we get you to think about selecting the market that you might work with. You may already have a very strong idea of where you want to go, but this is quite an interesting way of just testing out your readiness uh, as opposed uh, uh, against the market which you've chosen. So we ask you a series of questions uh, about uh, selecting the market. We encourage you to pick up three markets in particular and then start working down a whole list of countries, um, a, a whole list of things about those countries like language skills, whether you've got the payment ability, whether you have the legal aspects, perhaps you need to know more about getting paid in that country, um, perhaps you might need to know about how you're going to uh, operate as far as the legal side of things is concerned and though it gives you a series of actions and it compares, you give a score out of 10 for your own ability in my rating and then your ability in another market. So it may be that obviously See, these are quite unusual markets we've chosen here in Japan, South Korea and Uzbekistan uh, because there are very different cultures in each one of those. Having said that, one of those may come out and indeed I think at the end of this report there is a, 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 an option and the best market is apparently South Korea for the, the teddy bear company. So can we have the next slide? So when we're looking at reaching customers, um, we again ask a series of questions and you can see that there are some prompts there. You don't have to answer those questions, you can answer whatever question you want, but uh, <clears throat> it helps you often to think about your own domestic market and how your new international market may differ. Most importantly, you've got to think about reaching uh, particular customers and also bear in mind that sometimes you may find that um, you might use a distribution network here and find that, especially in Europe, they don't always have distributors in your sector. It might be uh, uh, more of a conglomeration of agents. And this type of uh, activity means that the agents are covered by different sorts of legislation to distributors. But all of this is explained to you within the, the exports uh, action plan, I promise. The website is full of information about this. As soon as you enter into it, you'll find it's just a treasure trove of information helping you. Uh, can I have the next slide? So talking about pricing and getting paid, I feel as if Craig did such a brilliant job on this that I don't have to do too much. But we do have to think about what your pricing strategy is. Again, that we know that the Brits have a tremendous habit of actually just uh, doing a cost plus pricing when actually there's a lot of elasticity in pricing and very often you can actually charge more as he was saying about it being made in Britain so it has a quality angle so it's quite important to understand and work with marketing people as to how that elasticity might reflect in your pricing. Um, obviously you've got to think about how you're going to be working within the um, uh, lines or in terms of um, return on investment and also how much it's going to cost you to collect money in that market because obviously everything has a cost. Uh, consider uh, what Craig has been saying about currency and options like invoice fan financing. What we have here also is a ready reckoner that will help you understand a little bit more about how to how to understand the dates that are involved in foreign exchange. Because foreign exchange has to include the number of days that your quote is valid for, as well as the payment terms, uh, so that in fact, effectively you're going to your foreign exchange bureau with a, a number of days where you may get paid in a foreign currency that allows you to then work back and decide which rate you're going to use unless you're one of the people that have worked with Bibi for a while and actually de determined uh, a yearly or, or a quarterly rate that you're allowed to use. Uh, this is a huge thing but having said that we've tried to simplify it and we've tried to make it as easy as we can to help businesses understand their exposure and once you've, you've worked through this ready reckoner it also gives you great ideas how your cash flow is going to operate as well in terms of the additional time it's going to take to get into that market. Uh, next slide. So delivery and documentation is the one thing that always sounds the most boring, but it's the one thing that actually will let down and destroy any business relationship you might have internationally. If you can't get your goods there on time with the right paperwork, all you're doing is making more anguish and heartache for your customer and it reducing the amount of times that they buy from you again. So what you've got to do is think very carefully about the mode of transport that you use and there are 
very different options uh, and reasons for using the different options of transport. Obviously, air freight is fabulous, but actually very costly if you've got something that's quite uh, heavy. You have to think about how you're going to do the paperwork and also the liabilities and obligations that you may face. Uh, the first of these two tasks are not required for services or software companies, uh, but you will need to consider things like inter uh, professional indemnity insurance, um, uh, intellectual property and VAT. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, then, so once you've, once you've been through all this uh, journey, and most people enjoy it, it takes between two and pr probably four hours to complete a full action plan. If you do it properly and you research it thoroughly, it could even take longer, but it's a really uh, uh, useful exercise, and actually we find it makes people really think about it, and I hope Rick's going to say that when he speaks in a moment. Let's just keep our fingers crossed. Uh, once you've completed all these questions and set actions in the, each of the sections, you can generate your report by clicking on that button, and then you can see it will uh, offer you the opportunity to generate the report. It tells you that all the sections are completed, so that's good. I often come up with uncompleted ones. Uh, and at that point, you can also ask if you'd like to submit your report to the action plan competition. And you have to check that box there we've just highlighted. And then it goes through to the competition. And is that the final click on that one? There we go. And then you win the competition. It's, it's not quite as straightforward as that. So what we do is we take um, every quarter, we look at the uh, applicants for people that have put their plans forward and we review them. We choose the top 10 and we take those top 10 and invite them along to present to us and to the judges. Bibi were at our last uh, event and you'll see, uh, you'll see the, a gentleman there from Bibi. Uh, and what they do is uh, we, we present, they present to us as to how we're going to, they're going to spend the £3,000, what actions they're going to take, you know, in the near future to really get their action plan up and going. And then the judges, normally about five people, real industry leaders, will make some decisions and award. And uh, it's, I have to say, it's inspiring. And what we also find, you'll go on to, if you go onto our website, there's a brilliant video on there talking about the people that have done it in the past, who've really enjoyed the experience of just actually meeting other small businesses and hearing what they're, what they do and how they get around it. It's a really great afternoon. Even if you don't actually get your action plan put forward, it's really useful to come along and listen to. And this one is showing actually uh, what we did at the uh, Swiss Embassy. We had a fabulous showcase, all the great companies as you can see there. And you know what we do is we try and help them understand how they can move forward. But most importantly, we give them a lot of exposure fantastic PR and networking opportunities and also they get a, gain a membership to the Institute of Export, they get discounted um, uh, training courses and the winner actually gets a couple of training courses free of charge. So there's quite a lot that everybody can get hold of the um, winning the competition. Next slide please. Okay, uh, so this is, you know, I mentioned about them getting discounts for learning. Um, uh, if we, if you don't have the skills, you know, we do say learn them. Uh, and uh, as Einstein always says, you know, if you uh, first you learn the w rules of the game, and then you can go out and learn uh, play it better than everyone else. And this is where we operate from. So the Institute of Exports got training courses covering all aspects of international trade. In co terms, we haven't spoken about a lot, but this is how you can actually determine uh, where the risk lies in the goods and what terms you who's going to be paying for what as far as uh, a contract is concerned very very useful to avoid any sort of confusions issues around shipping and documentation funding and more so what we have we have uh, courses for anybody at all different levels so if you feel that you're sort of an intermediate that's fine we can find you something that will fit with that actually what we're trying to do here is make sure everybody has a, a competitive advantage that they need to to really get by in this you know challenging and complex world that we're operating in now so we have four different levels uh, one is introductory one is operational 
and the, the second is third is the management and strategic uh, levels you'll find a course that's there we've all got somebody there to help you understand how that works um, we don't have any more than 15 people at the most at a training course again but it's a great opportunity for you to meet other people already operating in this market uh, we do do team training and we do things in-house as well so there's a lot of a lot of areas you can engage with us on this type of thing um, the next slide please um, and this again this is just showing you a section from our website explaining some of the different uh, buttons and actually that looks a lot more engaging than that last slide doesn't it can we move on to the next one okay so the other thing that we we do is we have professional qualifications and these are widely recognized um, as providing both employers and employees with the necessary international business practice that's linked with you know satisfying career and most importantly planning and development in international trade uh, they do enhance the employer's reputation uh, but also the, the participating staff have a great opportunity to show their knowledge and what we always do when we're working with a company with a student they they actually do all of their assessments on the company that they actually work with which means the company gets four different projects about their own business so the first project covers the pillar of learning all about uh, world trade intellectual property legal aspects of trading the second pillar is all about research marketing in different cultures the third pillar is all about actually getting paid and find a foreign exchange and the fourth pillar is all about the the uh, delivery compliance and regulation work we have a great mixture of theory and practice we use a, a blend of learning that's called uh, blended learning uh, it's it offers you a, a huge opportunity to get involved with uh, your tutor and with fellow students it's all provided online which means that you can do it in your own time uh, it's got videos it's got podcasts it's great to learn like this so um, we've got a great success rate on that as well um, can I have the next slide please Okay then, so tips for exporters in 2017. Actually, I think this is everyone's uh, first and uh, favorite one, spread your risk. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, look beyond the EU. Uh, start to think about the impact of different outcomes of Brexit. Think what impact could WTO rules have on you? We actually do have a course on what WTO means and the impact that would have. I know that sounds like a terrible plug, but I, I do think it's quite useful to actually understand how this works. Also, how free trade agreements work. Again, we've had a webinar on this and we have a lot of documents about it. If you understand how they work, you know how to take advantage of them. And you also know the ones that actually aren't going to benefit your business or your sector. Uh, remember the price you sh uh, should reflect the position you want in the marketplace and not just the lowest one you can offer. That really means understanding this price elasticity, but also about branding. It might be that you actually launch under two brands of a sort of a premium brand and, and a bulk that brand, but always have a good think about this because there's nothing worse than going into a new market and not actually uh, thinking it through, having to rebrand or having to reposition yourself. It's costly, it would waste probably, probably up to a year in a market uh, when you could be at your most effective. Um, and the other thing you should always be aware of, you should never stop learning about the markets you operate in. Just because you've done one set of research doesn't mean you shouldn't keep topping up and shouldn't mean that you know, the world is constantly changing, your market will be as well. And basically, never stop learning about how to do export either because, you know, I'm ever so old and I have to tell you, I learn something new every day. Do the training courses, read about trade, go to the conferences and summits, and at the very least, watch the news. The next slide, please. And I think at this point, I thought we were handy. Uh, uh, William was going to jump in and hand over to Rick. Hey there, Rick. I'm here. Hello. Uh, hello, Rick. Um, and Rick is one of our competition winners. He was fabulous. We had a great event uh, that f finished at the Foreign Office. And um, I'd like you to talk you through your slides now. Thanks, Rick. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm a, a, a previous winner of the uh, Export Action Plan competition. Um, I entered the competition earlier this year 
and um, was a winner in March. Um, doing the, the export plan online was something that's, we were at the very beginning of our sort of uh, exporting at the time. And it, it was something that really helped me to focus. I, I could see, I, I wanted to export and I could see all of these different things that I needed to do, but nothing to really help me make sense of it. And the action plan, the online action plan really focused my efforts and made me make some um, decisions helped me to make decisions that that just seemed cloudy beforehand so so it's a really great tool to use and then entering the competition and i'm winning it which was a, a massive shock to me i really didn't expect um to win just just gave me great confidence to to go ahead and um and export my my product and i've got great confidence in my products but i didn't necessarily have a great confidence in my ability to go out there and export it. It just seemed like this, this big world out there that, that um, I don't know, it just seemed like a, a massive, a massive thing. And it, it just gave me a load of confidence and made, made me able to, to go, go and do it. And, and, um, and I've had a great year this year, um, made some mistakes, uh, learned a great deal. Um, but a lot of it has been informed by what I've done with the export action plan. Um, and we are now, uh, we're now exporting to Italy. We've got a great distributor over there. We, we're just exporting to one country at the moment. We, we are researching other countries, but we're taking things one step at a time. Um, and I've got a great distributor over in Italy who, who's been really good to work with and, and has that's taught me a lot about exporting as well. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, and, you know, we're hoping to grow the company now um, through export. We, we think we can sell as much beer in Italy as we do in the UK. And um, working very closely with our distributor over there, um, we think that's going to help the the company need to grow. Could we go to the next slide? Um, and then using our experience of exporting to Italy, we're looking at other countries where we think we can possibly export to. So I've been on various trips this year to do research on other, on other territories. Um, and you know, we're, we're confident now that we can we can take our products all over the world. It's just finding the, the right places to go. And, and one great part of the export plan, the online export plan, is the way that it helps you to identify <clears throat> the problems that you might face when you go to different countries. Because there's places that I've thought, that's just a perfect place for us to go and export. But then when I've actually sat down with the export plan and gone through the difficulties that might be involved, it suddenly slides down your um, your list. It may not be as ideal as, as you first thought. Um, what we did with our prize money was to, if we could go to the next slide, invest in translations for our website. Um, so we got the, the website translated into the languages of the countries that we're going to be targeting. Um, and we also invested in some um, search engine optim optimization, um, which we're going to use for those territories when we start to, to target them so that if somebody does do a search for us in their, in their country and we're trying to sell to that country, we're, we're up there with the rest of the, uh, with, with the, on the first page of Google for gluten-free beer. And I believe there might be some questions that people would like to ask. So I'm ready to answer any questions now. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's always great to hear from from businesses who are in the processes of 
of taking the next steps in such a trade. So thank you for for coming on. Um, I appreciate it. It's it's, uh, it's not always easy to to talk about the mistakes you've you've made, but um, it's it's always good to hear kind of where where you've come from and and where you're going now. And uh, thank you again to Craig and Leslie. Um, some great tips and insights too. Um. As Rick just mentioned, we're going to open the floor now to questions. So please do ask questions using the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. Um, we've got about 10 minutes or so to do that. So um, please do ask away. And the first one I will put to Rick, um, it's actually from a, a brewing company. Uh, it's from Fran Francesca who asks, what approach did you have to ingratiating yourself in your new market um, and among local competitors? So yeah, Rick, do you want to, do you want to speak to that? Yes, well, I mean, this this has been a big thing that I've learned this year. Um, I have got myself a, a distributor over in Italy, and um, I think I've then gone and started I started to look for other other places that I can export to, and was maybe guilty of neglecting a, a little bit from the off. Um, and what I've learned is that you've, you've really got to invest in your, um, in your overseas partners. You've got to give them a lot of time. Um, going to visit them face to face is worth thousands of emails. Um, and I, I recently went over, I mean, we've, we've kept in contact we've talked on the phone sent emails backwards and forwards but i recently went over to italy for 10 days to spend some time in the market with him and it just made me realize that i should have been doing that all along i should maybe have not been spending time looking at other markets um i should have been with my customer in his market and um and spending time there and, and 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 talking and being there you know for day to day seeing what he does and seeing what it is that you can do to help your your products in, in that market um and and the upshot of that of that visit has been we've probably um quadrupled our sales in a very very short period of time just by getting a greater understanding of each other um, and I think that's really, really important to, to spend that time one-to-one uh, -one if you can with, with your customers. Thanks, Rick. And I think Leslie has something to add to that as well. Leslie? Well, yes, because I have the fortunate uh, position of being, um, I work for large manufacturers and I also work for distributors. Uh, and I have to tell you, when I work for the distributor, I realised that actually uh, as a large manufacturer, we often used to leave us very much on our own. And it's a wonderful point you're making, Rick, invest in these people. And they used to come over to visit us in the UK. And when it was going home time, we all sort of went like, oh, buy them, we'll see you tomorrow morning. We didn't look after them in the evenings and didn't make sure they felt valued. And I think, again, this is a very uh, important part of, uh, you know, they are part of your team and you wouldn't tr treat a salesman like that. And somehow or other we treat them like, you know, quite badly. So the the lesson you learned was really brilliant. Cool, brilliant. Thank you, thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Rick, as well. Um, a good answer, definitely. Um, I'm going to bring Craig back into the fold quickly. Um, a question around uh, kind of currency and and a, a, the currency kind of points, and it's it's from um it's from Rajesh, and he asks around, is it recommended to set up uh, overseas bank accounts and try and do kind of transactions solely in, in overseas currencies or, or kind of what, what approach do you have to that sort of um, approach? Yeah, I, I think you can do, um, you know, so we, we deal with, with lots of different currencies. So I think that, that generally, that generally helps. But I think the, the key thing is if, if you look at, I suppose the, the advice would be just, that's uh, right. Take a step back. A lot, a lot of businesses we see deal on 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 what's known as spot deals. So you know they they go into their bank or their boutique and they get they get the rate on on that day of whatever the the currency is. Uh, and generally, I think you know that I think what's come out of this seminar for me is you know the planning is is so important. So you know just thinking about potentially what what happens. You know how how much. How much risk do you want to take that if the rate moved on you? What, what would that actually do to the prof profitability of that transaction you, you're setting up? 
So I think it's more, it, it is about planning, it's about getting advice, it's about working with, you know, your, your foreign exchange provider. You know, are they proactive for you? Are they looking on a day-to-day -day basis to see what the rates are doing? Keep an eye out, I think, like Leslie said, about, you know, reading, reading the news because, you know, it, it does get impacted. The volatility does get impacted by, by certain things, you know, the talks around Brexit, any any breakdown in talks, any any nervousness around those talks and how it's progressing, that that can impact. So I think it's very much about working really closely with a provider and in, in, in talking about, you know, whether fixing in, you know, locking in a rate, you know, like you would maybe a fixed mortgage, but locking in a rate, is that going to be beneficial to your uh, your business? So although foreign currency accounts can help, I think that's only one part of it, to be honest. Thank you, Craig. Um, really good answer to my slightly garbled <laughs> rendition of the question. Um, so no, now, no, also, there's a lot to worry about. Will, sorry, guys, uh, about our money laundering uh, laws and um, setting up bank accounts isn't as easy as it, it sounds, um, unless you have somebody in that market that's going to help you do that. So uh, it, it's not always a small business that can do that as easily. We've been helping a couple of businesses recently about this, and it's got very complex. So uh, you do need to take a lot of advice. Sorry, I'm not trying to be negative. Just just warning against the, 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 the amount of work involved. No, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. That's a really good good point to, to add. Um, a question, another one for Rick. It's from Alison, and uh, I hate to put you on the spot, Rick, but kind of what were the three most important things you learned in terms of exporting your beer this year? I think I've already said the, the, the first most important one is to, is to get that relationship with your overseas distributor. Um, that, that's so important to, to understand each other and um, for them to understand your products and for you to understand how they're, um, they're selling your products. Um, packaging. Um, I I've made a mistake, I think, with hindsight, I've made a mistake with the way that I've packaged my products um, for that particular market in that I have done a, um, I've, I've translated the packaging in, into Italian and I've, I've, I've got a, a products that I send with Italian, with just an Italian label on there. Um, which makes it difficult for me to call stock off at short notice. Um, with hindsight, I should have packaged it. I should have added the Italian translation to my English packaging so that if I needed to send something at short notice, I could just call it off my regular stock and I didn't have to package it specifically for, for that market. Um, and the third thing, um, The value of researching, um, there's a couple of places I've, I've been on, on trips to, thinking that I could sell a lot of, a lot of beer there and, and realized I've not wasted a trip, but I'm not ready for that market yet. Um, and I think actually going to a country and, and seeing how things work there is, is invaluable. Um, it doesn't mean that I won't, be looking to export to these places in the future but I came back with a list of things that I need to do before I can before I can go there and, and um, I think that the, that the market research um, just by physically going to, to somewhere is is just invaluable and so I think that they're the three things that I've learned this year. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, for, for very good on on the spot to, um, to kind of come up with that. So uh, yes, yeah, uh, three very key things. And on the packaging, I was just going to ask Leslie. I mean, how do you find out in terms of the packaging requirements and the what you need to the skills that you need to do in order to get things like packaging right from from the off? How how, how do you find that out, Leslie? Well, I suppose uh, I suppose uh, the, the one thing I would always say is look at your larger competitors because they've normally got the you know they've got it 
right. Um, also, there are the technical helpline that we run that we can actually always find out for you what uh, the, the legal requirements are and the regulatory requirements are. But then there's also the skill of actually packaging something that actually is appealing to uh, that market in particular. Um, you know, when you often look at things, and I, I mean, I just, you know, I just broke my ankle and the, the leg brace they gave me was had, had 16 different languages on it. You know, uh, they're doing that because that's, as you said, you know, you can draw down from that each time. You don't have to keep bringing out a different one for each market. So I think it's, it is it's a, a valuable lesson because you need to worry about stock holdings too. Uh, and it becomes increasingly difficult as time goes on. Well done, Ray. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. And um, just one more, one more question. We're just about to run over. I'm just going to ask one more question. It's from Flora, who's actually one of our other previous finalists this year. And she asked, what sorts of other organizations are out there to, to help you um, in terms of starting to export effectively? Um, so I, I mean, I guess everyone can speak a little bit to that, but uh, Leslie, do you want to start with that? Then Craig, then, then Rick. If that, if that. Yeah. I mean, I think as far as actually starting to export, obviously, um, you know, we're uh, very big supporters working with the government on this, and that's the Department for International Trade. You'll notice that it, it actually has at the bottom of the uh, action plan tool where you should take your, your action plan to, and that's one of the international trade advisors or to one of the government departments to try and help you work that out. Uh, obviously, the British Chambers of Commerce are very good at helping as far as the uh, documentation are concerned. Concerned. Um, as far as uh, markets are concerned, there are a lot of uh, different embassies. Uh, I don't know whether I mentioned the fact we actually run, um, we publish doing business guides that also have a lot of contacts in the different markets that might be useful to you. Um, there's a huge amount of help out there. UK Export Finance, some of the insurance companies are very useful. Don't forget you're going to need insurance whenever you go into a new market, um, not just for the goods, not just for public liability, but also possibly professional indemnity if you're giving advice at all so it's quite you know it's quite a lot of things to remember uh, there are checklists available obviously we're going to tell you about the open twist export one and of course there are private consultancies that help people on these things as well you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of people out there all willing to help i think it's about biting the bullet and asking people for help uh, and accepting that possibly you know not everybody knows everything about everything no, that's really good, Leslie. I, I would just add, I think, um, you know, get involved in networking events because I think like, like Rick has just highlighted, you know, people are actually doing it and been through it. I think that's a, a massive source of information in tapping into that. I think, as Leslie said, that there's a hell of a lot of that out there on, on the Internet. So spending some time to, to research it. And as I said, from a financier's perspective, you know, making sure you, you speak to your financiers, you can help help you but also you know work closely with the organizations leslie's mentioned as well so um yeah but the key thing for me i think is you know network with people and speak to people who've been through it Craig, thank you so much for saying that because actually we've got a whole series of networking events up and down the country every month. There's an, and thank you for reminding me we're doing that. Uh, do look out for that. They'll be advertised on Open to Export and the Institute. Um, and also we we have big events for students to, to come and study. You know, yes, sorry. Thank you so much for networking and learning from other people is absolutely key. Well done. Sorry, Craig. <laughs> no problem. And Rick, if I could just add to that, yeah. well, um, uh, Leslie, you mentioned um, international trade advisors. Um, I've got a fantastic international trade advisor. Um, I went, I, I did the um, passport to export um, course. And um, if uh, she doesn't know the answer to my question, she almost certainly knows somebody who does know the answer to my question and, and can help me out. And the, and the network of help that I've got just through having an international trade advisor has been fantastic. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, they're all members of ours and uh, we support them thoroughly and we're very proud to hear you say that. So well done. Thanks. Great. Well, um, I think on that note, uh, thank you. Thank you again to, to Rick, Leslie and, and Craig today. Um, we've, we have sorry everyone, but I think it's been um, a really useful and dense kind of session just getting all of that, um, 
all of that information out there because it's such a big thing planning to export. So it, it is a big topic and, and that's probably why we want over slightly. So yeah, thank you to all three speakers. Right, so um, we're coming to an end of the year in terms of events to review with the Institute. Um, we will be updating the site with um, some of the events that Leslie was just mentioning just then um, in the new year. So do keep your eyes peeled for those and always have a look at some of the training courses the Institute runs from, from one day courses on incoderms to master's degrees and international strategy. It's, it's all there, as Leslie was mentioning earlier. So do have a look at the site. There's so much going on. And then from the open export point of view, um, that's it for our 2017 webinar program. It's, it's been a fantastic year. We've certainly covered a lot. Uh, thank you to everyone who's attended any of this year's sessions or watched recordings on YouTube afterwards. Do have a look at opentextbook.com forward slash webinars to look through all of our previous webinars and also to sign up to the first webinar in 2018, which would be an update on what exporters need to know about Brexit next year. 2018 will obviously see the talks move on to the future trading relationship. So it will be a very interesting and very topical session for sure. So definitely do sign up for that. As always, please do take our exit survey to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to give us any suggestions for improvements for future topics. Um, but from all the team, we wish you an extremely Merry Christmas and a fabulous New Year. And that's goodbye from us. Thank you.